giant dogs that may or may not uh, decide to start drinking water. So, excellent. All part of working from home. Hey, Dave. Exactly. Hopefully, we are all learning the etiquette of working from home if uh, you have not been working from home already. John, I particularly like your still frame because it almost looks like a video window. So I imagine you holding that facial pose for us continuously. All right, just a couple more minutes here. All right, let's just All right, check with that, it's seven o'clock. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to see if we could uh, get this set up here. Um, yeah, Arsh, if you want to go ahead and start the recording, uh, and I will uh, do my best at an intro here and let Adam take it away. All right. Sounds good. Oh, um, you have to start a recording. Your host now. Oh, okay. Here we go. Okay, I think we are recording, yes. So, uh, welcome everyone to a very unusual monthly meetup for the Dev Alliance. We're obviously only in our home or <clears throat> remote locations. So this is a bit of an experiment in format. Um, we have Adam Link tonight that's going to, uh, who's gonna share with us some incredible things about uh, what he's working on. Um, and I, I know Adam from uh, working with him on the Dev Alliance board and a little bit about his work and what he teaches. And uh, he knows as much in the business world as in the tech world. So I'm excited to see what he has in store for us tonight. Take it away, Adam. All right, well, thank you very much. Can everyone hear me all right? Yeah, you're coming through clear. All right, yep. perfect, okay. so. I am going to uh, give a presentation here tonight on secrets management. Um, the goal of secrets management is a fairly broad topic. I will try to give uh, examples as I can as we go along. For those of you who don't know me, I don't actually have an introduction slide. I just realized that. Um, I am on the, uh, the board of the Developers Alliance. I am our treasurer. So I am responsible for paying for all the uh, hopefully wonderful activities everyone has been enjoying uh, through the Dev Alliance. I am also a adjunct uh, professor at the University of Alaska Anchorage. I teach a class on business systems analysis and design. Uh, when I'm not doing extracurriculars, I have a day job where I am the head of cybersecurity and infrastructure for a company called Fluidity out of Brooklyn, New York. So I have been a remote worker for about seven years of my life now. Welcome to my world um, of sitting at home all day, uh, listening to the siren call of the couch, beckoning you for a nap after lunch. Hopefully everyone is adjusting to the uh, work from home life here. Uh, it does take a little bit of adjustment to get used to. Um, so 
with that said, that's kind of me. I will get into secrets management and uh, why this why this matters. So secrets management in technology deals with managing the secrets of your tech stack. Um, not all code that we write as developers should be visible to everyone. And certainly not every line that we write should be visible to everyone inside the company. So this means even our own developers sometimes don't need access to every single line and every single configuration file. This especially is true in small projects where we run into issues where one person will start developing and then check in their code to GitHub. And six months later, they've you know, maybe brought on a team member or two and a team member then leaves. And you know, all of a sudden you have the potential of your code and your configuration being stuck on a former team member's computer. Or even if you sanitize your GitHub repo and pull all the secrets out of your GitHub repo, um, there is still a commit history. And so every employee you will hire for the remainder of the time that your company uses this repository will be able to see every single commit and every single secret that was left in your repository. So this isn't a great thing. And this is why secrets management has come up time and again throughout kind of programming history. I'm going to talk about my experiences tonight. And if I've learned anything doing cybersecurity, it's that no matter what you say, someone will disagree with what you say and say it's the most insecure way they've ever seen to do that particular implementation in their life and you should be fired. And it's great because you get to fire back with the exact same thing about their implementation. So what that means is if you are a senior developer here, you can disagree with what I'm going to say. Some of the things I'm gonna talk about, um, you might say is completely dumb or it adds latency or what do you mean 60 milliseconds to do an API call? Uh, you know, I can't do that. I'm under 100 millisecond tops for my API endpoints. And that's okay. The only wrong way to do secrets management is storing everything in plain text. And I, I will fight that battle. But <laughs> um, I think the particular implementation of it, there are faster and slower ways. But as long as you're not storing stuff in plain text, that's really the most important thing I want you to take away from the time tonight. So what secrets do we have as a tech group or as a technology company or just a company in general, right? So the first thing that we're going to talk about is passwords. Um, passwords are probably by far the most common secret that any piece of infrastructure is going to have and certainly any company will have. From there, you know, API keys are generally the second most uh, likely secret string that you're going to have. And then tokens, these can be you know, short-lived tokens, these can be long-lived tokens. If you're familiar with authentication mechanisms like uh, Kerberos or OAuth, these are token-based authentications. Then there's database uh, connection strings and database connection strings, as I'm sure you know, it can be your, your MySQL database, it can be stuff like Redis connection strings, um, private keys is another common secret that we have. This can be anything from a um, public private key pair to a, a symmetric key, um, just really any sort of a private key that we're using for encryption. Then if you use a cloud provider, there are cloud provider keys. So these are your API access credentials if you're familiar with AWS. Um, I will put a caveat out right now. You'll be hearing a lot about AWS tonight. That's the primary cloud service provider that I build uh, infrastructure in, and so I happen to know a lot about it. But AWS provides access keys uh, that if they are leaked can lead to incredibly high bills because people uh, comb GitHub constantly looking for these and they will spin up servers that cost hundreds of dollars a day uh, very quickly if you do leak your keys. And the last thing is you may just have secrets you're currently protecting by security through obscurity. Um, you know, maybe configuration values or other types of things that your application needs to run that wouldn't be great if the public knew, but it probably also wouldn't mean the end of your company. And there's more secrets, right? So start thinking about things beyond just application secrets. Maybe you can think about things like IP address ranges, right? 
Um, certainly, if I know your internal IP address ranges, then I can start enumerating over a much smaller range if I'm attacking your company. Uh, corporate processes, right? So this may be something beyond technology now into how do you move things through a warehouse? Um, that corporate process, you know, could involve some sort of uh, top secret materials. You know, perhaps you're working on, on the base here um, and that process is a classified process. For larger companies, I'm thinking like GCI, um, some of the bigger tech companies around here, certainly our payroll and SSNs are incredibly secret. You know, we don't want to be leaking our uh, company information or employee information. Something most startups will run into is your credit cards. Uh, credit cards are secret information that need to be kept secure and need to be used. And the same thing goes for bank account numbers. Um, I'm not sure if many of you on the call here are familiar with uh, the NACHA standard, but essentially the entirety of our banking system runs on a flat file format that uh, you can take money out of anyone's account if you know their routing number and account number uh, and you don't need permission. They will just process through FTP anything you upload. And lastly, uh, license keys, right? A lot of corporate software has license keys that need to be kept secret. Thinking of, you know, like uh, back in the day, like Adobe, right? Uh, Adobe license keys were incredibly popular to steal from employers and go run your own company uh, or run side projects. And there's even more, right? You know, we can start thinking about, well, what about driver's license numbers, right? If we're processing identity or passport numbers or the classic when you walk into an office, the first thing on every whiteboard you look for in the upper right-hand corner is the Wi-Fi password, right? And I, I can't tell you how many times I've walked into businesses where one of the first things you see as you walk past the conference room is the Wi-Fi password sitting on a whiteboard, right? Well, that's a secret. That should be managed because me as somebody who's walking past now has unfettered access to their Wi-Fi. And hopefully they've segmented VLANs so I don't have access to their internal corporate network, but there's no guarantee that I don't. And which kind of brings us to the guest access codes, right? So these can be things like uh, bathroom access codes or front door access codes, uh, guest Wi-Fi passwords. Um, I mean, even, even something as innocuous as like the guest bathroom, um, you can find ways to, you know, leave something on uh, a power port there, you know, running a, uh, uh, like a, a Wi-Fi scanner. So there, there's a lot of reasons to look at secrets holistically beyond just kind of what we usually think about as technologists. But it's important to start thinking about these holistically because it allows you to go back to your company and kind of help them, you know, maybe take the Wi-Fi passwords off the whiteboard. So with most secrets, where do secrets end up, right? And for those of you who don't know what this picture is, um, this is, I guess, the Hawaii Emergency Response uh, center. I think this is after the missile, uh, the fake missile crisis that they had. And there's a picture of a dude and in the background on the monitor is supposedly his password. And it's on a post-it note, right? And so how many times have you, you know, caught yourself necessarily like looking at a, a coworker's screen or something and thought, oh, that's interesting. That's a configuration file. I know for me, we, uh, we had Bloomberg News covering one of the events that my company was doing and we had a camera crew in the office. And I was incredibly cognizant of the fact that I had IDEs open and I had configuration files, you know, and I was connected to servers via SSH. And there's just internal stuff that you don't want necessarily getting out to the public. And so, you know, as, a, as an IT auditor, right, you, you come past and you see this and you go, well, that's cute. You know, you, you write your password on a sticky note. So tell me how no one else will see this. Like, you know, we, we live here in the in tech land. We certainly know that putting passwords on post-it notes is a really dumb idea. No one on this call does that, right? Well, when I was in IT audit, I cannot tell you how many times we would go in to the technology group of a, a business unit and start looking for passwords. So I would go audit cubes uh, physically, like, uh, like employee cubicles, one of the first things I would do is I'd flip over the keyboard and I'd look for a post-it note there. And then I'd look in the top of the desk drawer. And then I'd actually crawl underneath the desk and look underneath where people would sit. And then I'd look at the bottom of their desk drawer if they had a pull-out drawer. I'd look at the side of their cabinets. I'd look behind the picture frames. I'd look underneath the desk shelf. And I'd look underneath the mouse pad. And if I just named one of the places where you store a post-it note with a password on it, 
then please remove the post-it note and get a password manager. That's your first thing to do tomorrow because it's not hard to guess where most people store their secrets. But we're better than that, right? We're the, we're the tech people, right? We're the engineers. We understand how to do secrets management. So I don't know who here's familiar with Google dorks and GitHub dorks, but essentially what these are, are search strings that you can enter into like Google or GitHub and you can look for interesting things. What this Google or what this GitHub dork underneath um, the link here does is looks for .env .environment files that include the string mail underscore host equals smtp.gmail.com. What this does is it tells GitHub to look in public env files for an environment variable declaration that likely has login credentials for Gmail's SMTP above and below it. And this is just one of like hundreds of GitHub dorks that are public at this URL. <laughs> and of course, right, we're tech people. No one would do this. Actually, there's over 6,000 results of publicly available GitHub repos that include this string and above and below it are usernames and passwords. So when I looked earlier today, the top result was a Linares82. And let me tell you, they had their password on the third line down. And it was great. I didn't check it. Uh, that's, that's illegal. But when you start to think about what this means, if you assume that you can send about 500 emails per day before Gmail bounces your account for spam, right? That's like, I'm going to do public math here. What is it, like 300,000 emails a day that you could send out? as spam just using this single dork, which of course is going to cause a whole bunch of people's Gmail accounts to be shut down for spamming. And so there's gotta be a better way to do these secrets, right? So let's not be a statistic. And I'm going to walk through the philosophy that I use for storing secrets um, within the organization that I help secure. So I think of secrets like a pyramid. And I apologize if anyone is uh, online and this is a little bit small, um, but the idea here is to showcase kind of the three levels that I look at when it comes to code and secrets management. So at the very top of our pyramid here is our code. This is what we check into our source control. And it doesn't really matter too much if other people see it you know, at the company. And I'd even go so far as to say, if you're doing this right and you're only checking in code and nothing else, the worst thing that would happen if this goes public is somebody sees the business logic that you wrote. And if you're doing something unique at your company, this might be an issue. But if you think of something like an API endpoint that's just checking if a user is logged in or not, that really shouldn't be the end of the world because hashing and comparing passwords is something that we all basically know how to do in technology. So that's our first level. Our second level is our build pipeline. And this is where the secrets enrichment starts. So this is where we have a few select developers who have set up a automated build pipeline with machine credentials. And that allows us to go in and start enriching this code with things like deployment keys, with things like signing keys, with things like um, you know, maybe some of our configuration files now come in. And then that build pipeline moves into our deployed environment. And that's where even fewer people have access. This should just be your operations team, um, you know, maybe some very senior operations individuals. And this is where our programs really meet with the full runtime specification of their secrets. Uh, so this might be actually bringing down complete environment files this is certainly loading up environment variables that have secrets in them. Uh, this is runtime access to secrets, you know, loading secrets into memory, uh, loading our encryption keys and decrypting volumes. Um, so this is really the point at which access should be restricted because there's a high risk of someone catting out an environment variable to console, right? And that environment variable could be something like a um, you know, private key. So if that made sense to you, great. If it didn't, here's kind of the way 
What, what did I just say? What I'm assuming is in your engineering organization, you follow the Git flow model, which involves branching and pulling and a master branch and a development branch. I'm assuming you have your source uh, code under version control. I'm assuming you have an automated build process. If you don't have an automated build process, it's very difficult to start enriching your code to secrets because a human has to do that. And that means that somebody is still seeing your secrets, which is really not what we want to end up with. I'm assuming you have separate environments. I'm assuming you have separate environments to limit the blast radius of bad changes. And I'm also assuming this because it's going to start to force the engineering team to think more holistically about how they do secrets management because you can't just use the same secrets for every environment. And I'm also going to assume that you never hard code your credentials. And this is very important because once you have separate environments, you can't hard code credentials, hopefully, because you're changing credentials across the environments, hopefully. So a couple of common scenarios uh, that I've run into in my career, and this is both how I've solved them and some best practices. And then we'll get into uh, a little bit of hands-on work and how I've actually uh, solved some, some more recent problems uh, at, at my company and then also just some personal side projects. So the first thing I wanna stress here, uh, even if you are not like a super hands-on developer and you don't really have say over where you're storing secrets for production, you can certainly start practicing best practices for secrets management using passwords and credit cards. So don't send passwords and credit cards via Slack. Don't send them via email. Don't text them to people. And please don't write your passwords down and post this. Right? Now, I will say there's a small asterisk here next to Slack. Um, I actually forgot to put it in the slide. But there is an add-on for Slack called Secrets, I believe. It uh, opens up the slash secret. Uh, command, which supposedly is an ephemeral message, but I haven't audited any code, so I can't guarantee they aren't storing all your secrets somewhere. And email, I would say probably don't send credit cards and passwords over email, but if you do practice uh, dual band sending, so like send most of the credit card and send the rest of the credit card via text message, that's at least better than sending everything in an unencrypted email. But if you are going to send these credentials, Something to really think about is getting a password manager. So one password is what I use. Uh, other people use like KeyPass or Dashlane or LastPass. And the idea here is you're relying on a third party to encrypt your credentials and securely share them so you're not sharing passwords in plain text. The last thing you can do is PGP encryption, which I will tell you, I work in cybersecurity and I sometimes get confused by PGP encryption. Um, it is not at all really user friendly, but it is incredibly powerful. Something I want to leave you with to think about as a quick and easy improvement is look for places in your code bases where you're using a username and password for programmatic access and try to figure out a way to do tokens or API keys instead. So for instance, I run into this all the time when I'm writing bash scripts that it's very easy when you're running a CLI command to just follow through the prompts, right? There's an interactive, uh, command that you're running, you know, you're, you're typing uh, GitHub commands for the first time, you go to push to GitHub, and it pops up and says, hey, you know, can you type in your username and password in the CLI? You're like, sure, no problem. The minute you move to automated build processes, though, doing interactive mode commands becomes incredibly difficult because you have to use um, a package that basically injects the uh, text into a pseudo terminal, and that requires you to store the username and password somewhere. And you certainly don't want to have that in plain text in a deployment script. So start to look for places where you can use tokens and API keys instead of using and password, because that will at least secure the account that is generating those tokens and API keys. Right? You're not getting away your password. Uh, an API key can be rotated. So we're going to go through a couple slides here on ways to store secrets depending on context. Um, Application configurations, I will say bad isn't on here, but bad is just plain text hard-coded, right? Good application configurations is I have a private repo and a .env file. Earlier, you saw what happened with a public .env file, but as long as you keep it private, like this isn't bad. A better way to do this is to obfuscate the secrets instead of storing them in plain text, right? So like base64 in code. 
And for the senior devs on you, you're like, wait, but base 64 encoding, I can recognize that and easily know I can decode it. Well, yes, you can. But if someone's just running through with a script looking for passwords, they're just going to pull the base 64 encoded password and try to inject that. Um, you know, they're not going to catch in a script that it's encoded. So this is better than nothing. Even better, though, is storing it in an encrypted format and storing the decryption key elsewhere, which gets us onto our best way of storing application configurations, which is encrypted, stored outside of the application code, decrypted as the environment variable. I use the container environment variable. And then the decryption key itself is actually stored elsewhere and accessed via an API. This completely decouples our application code from our configuration. Database strings is another uh, very common context that you'll be storing. A uh, bad way to do this is coding it in the top of your file and saying, here's our static single database for all of our code. It's really bad. Also bad is taking all this, moving it off to a, another file, and then uh, including this file in everything that you need DB access for. Right? A better way to do this is you store it statically and have a separate database for each environment. This isn't as great, but at least now you're limiting your blast radius. An even better way of doing this is storing it statically, but having a separate username and password for each environment. Because now at the very least, you know, you're not breaching every environment if somebody gets a uh, hold of username and password. I'd say the best way of doing this though, and this is a little bit AWS specific, but using role-based access and auto-rotating your secrets or your uh, login information every uh, 30 to 90 days and injecting that via API into your application at runtime. Cloud provider keys, this is like AWS access keys and stuff like that. Um, what I will say right off the bat is don't use access keys for your programs in AWS. Um, if you are using AWS and you are passing access keys and secret keys, that is a deprecated method the AWS uh, security team has not recommended that for about five years now. And you should be switching to role-based authentication and authorization. Every AWS resource supports it. If you don't know how to do this, just hit me up um, on our Slack. I'm happy to walk you through how to do this. Another thing with uh, cloud provider keys is you should be rotating your individual user account access keys fairly frequently. I actually wrote a program and open sourced it, available at aws-iam-keys.com. Um, I was working on this today, actually, to integrate it with a CSD pipeline that we'll go through. Um, and then any, any cloud provider keys that you are storing, like on your laptop or something like that, you should be storing on full disk encryption disks. And what this means is at boot, you have to enter a password in order to decrypt your disk. And your laptop is essentially uh, unusable if somebody were to steal it. Um, you can correct me if you're a part of the FBI or the NSA and you're like, no, we can get past that. That's okay. Um, but for the for the mo vast majority of us, full disk encryption storage of your local credentials is, is fine. Uh, private keys. So some people may be thinking, wait, private keys. This is like, you know, um, asymmetric encryption, public private key cryptography. I'm not doing PGP, right? Well, if you're SSHing into boxes on a regular basis, you are using a private key to do that. Um, so a bad way to manage these SSH keys is emailing PEM files around. I'm guilty of this. I last did this, I think, seven years ago. And uh, my ops guy basically told me, you need to completely burn this PEM key, burn the server, uh, never do that again. And I was like, oh, OK, fair enough. Um, it makes sense because you start emailing these uh, private keys over email that may or may not be encrypted. You should essentially consider that key burn. A good way to do this, and I do this for some PEM files, is I save them in one password as a note. And that basically allows you to go back and grab that PEM file anytime I need to recreate it as I'm moving between machines. I don't do this for uh, servers that I care about. I do this for like private, um, just scratch servers. Um, but you can also do like PGP encryption. Most uh, Nix servers like Unix and stuff like that will support generating PGP keys and storing them in a keychain locally. But a better way to do this is to use a feature of SSH, which is the authorized underscore keys file. This basically allows you to authorize multiple SSH keys for an individual instance. 
In the case of AWS, AWS will carry forward authorized keys from one AMI, which is an instance, um, basically a, an instance image. It'll carry that forward from one instance to the next. So you can start adding authorized keys for every authorized user at your company to access that server. That is a much better way than trying to all share a single private key. Uh, and then cloud managed keys as well, AWS. So now we're moving from SSHing into like encrypting, decrypting, and digitally signing for private keys. Uh, AWS provides a cloud managed key service where they will take care of the private key and the key management rotation, encryption, and decryption. That's, I'd say, the better side. And the best side is if you are working with the military or the government and you need to be FIPS 140-2 certified, uh, you get an HSM, which is a, a hardware security module. Um, and AWS provides one as cloud HSM. It is FIPS 140-2 certified. And essentially, what this is, is a separate physical device that creates the private key in a physically separated location and then uses that private key for signing encryption and decryption. Um, not many people may need this, but it is an option for those that are working with the government. Next thing is uh, AWS. So within AWS, these are the services that I use fairly frequently to uh, store and uh, manipulate secrets. So all my environment variables go into what's called EC2 SSM parameter store. I'll show you all this in a second after this slide. All my cont uh, container variables uh, go into Kubernetes secrets. So Kubernetes carries with it its own secret manager. Um, fa fairly good, but I actually prefer AWS a little bit um, more than uh, Kubernetes secrets. Lambda variables go into secrets manager, which is another service AWS provides for managing and rotating secrets. Database credentials uh, is integrated with Secrets Manager, so I get automatic 30-day rotation on all of my user accounts. And I also have the ability to lock this down by AWS IAM roles. All of my private keys I use for encryption and decryption go into KMS. I don't use Cloud HSM because uh, I don't work with government, but I do have uh, one-year rotation on all of my uh, customer-managed keys for all my private keys. So basically everything that I store encrypted uh, will be decrypted and have had the key rotated every year. And then anything else that I need to store that's a secret goes into S3 with uh, server-side encryption on a key that I control, which is SSS E-C, uh, with blocked public access, a write, write once read many or worm vault lock and version. Uh, so this basically ensures that what I upload once will always stay there and not change. And also nobody else can access it. So I'm going to let's see here, minimize this. Okay. And now we're gonna go into a little bit of a tech demonstration here. Cause I'm super excited. I whipped all of this up in about, I'd say 30 or 40 minutes today. So what I wanna show everyone here, hopefully you can see my code on my screen now. Um, if I could get somebody to be like, yes, I can, that'd be awesome. It, can you, can you bump up the size a little bit on the window, Adam? Is that possible? Let's see. Yes, I can. Much better. Is that better? That's better. Cool. All right. So for those of you who are not familiar with AWS, the service we're using right now is called AWS Lambda. And essentially what Lambda is, is it is a uh, VM that runs your code as a function as a service. Uh, so this code gets executed inside of a special uh, Docker container, which is hosted in a VM. And basically the, the VM gets spun up, executes this code and gets torn down. And the response is returned back. Uh, what I'm going to show you here is kind of starting at the top, uh, we include the AWS SDK for those of you who don't like JavaScript, I'm sorry, I only code in JavaScript and Bash. Uh, I don't know Python well enough to do this in Python in 20 minutes. <laughs> and then uh, basically updated my regions. So we're using three services here in AWS, S3. So I'll show you what getting a secret from S3 looks like. SSM, this is a uh, secured and unsecured parameter store used for environment variables. And Secrets Manager, 
uh, which is used for database and um, really is now the preferred method of storing API keys and tokens and other long-lived secrets rather than using SSM. Um, and the reason for that is you can access Secrets Manager via API, whereas SSM you have to inject into the environment. So Secrets Manager gives you the ability to uh, be resilient to somebody just catting out all your environment variables to their console. Uh, they will not see the secrets from Secrets Manager. So what we've got going on then inside of the actual function is we first are accessing an S3 bucket. It's called my secret Lambda bucket. Um, if you have a console up for AWS, you can try to get into this. You shouldn't be able to. Uh, public access is blocked. And inside of that is a key called my secret.txt. Then we're going to load in some secrets uh, here from SSM. I'll show you guys the difference between encrypted and decrypted and plain text secrets. And then a managed secret from Secrets Manager. Um, so I'm not going to show you the S3 bucket because it is going to give away what's in the secret here. But what I will show you is systems, so SSM parameter store. Uh, this is basically two secrets. And one is a plain secret here. And you can see the value. This is a plain secret. And this would be something that is like an environment variable that you might need to configure, but doesn't need to be hidden necessarily from users. Um, the next secret we'll see here is an encrypted secret. Now, when I click on this, what you see here is this value is blanked out. And there's a show button. And the reason there's a show button here is I'm running as an administrator inside this account. And so I have admin access to decrypt the secret. If I didn't have access to decrypt this secret, you would not be able to see this secret. Um, you can see under here the history as well as to what the value uh, was. And again, encrypted because you can't see it, and who modified it. So this is an ongoing audit log of who's changed the secret. And you are able, as an admin, to get a history of what the secret was changed to in case something malicious happens. You're able to roll it back. Um, and I will show you guys the secret here, right? So this is encrypted. And you saw the little spinner there briefly that basically went and checked my permission, made sure I had permission to decrypt it, and then brought me the plain text value. Under parameter store here as well, under secrets plain, you can also see a history. So you can see what it changes to, right? So if I come in here and I click edit, and I say this is a plain secret, the explanation points, hit save changes, go into plain, go into history. You can see that I changed this to this is a plain secret. So again, super helpful if you need to show an audit log uh, for compliance purposes of who's changing what series. And I, I can get further into the compliance stuff on a private basis, but I can also show you who's accessed and decrypted and all and how they've used this secret. Secrets manager here, this would be like for database credentials, API tokens, any sort of long lived uh, secrets like that. You can see here the secret name I have stored under a path. Uh, so for prod top secret slash database, and the secret value here, again, you're going to be able to see this because I'm running as an admin. If you did not have decryption privileges, you would not be able to retrieve the value. You can see here it's a key value pair of DB pass, and this is my database password, exclamation point. Because uh, this is a secret I set up, there is no rotation enabled. But if you were to, for instance, go into secrets, store a new secret, and say credentials for RDS, or for Redshift if you're doing data warehousing, uh, you can specify username and password. And I have to click next. That's not going to do that. But anyway, um, under configure rotation step three, you're basically given the ability to rotate this as uh, as little as every 30 days, I believe, and as long as every 90. So with that, you know, you get automated rotation. Assuming your service can stand losing database connectivity and restart itself, this is a great way of ensuring that your database is going to be secure. So with that, this little block of code right here is going to go through and query the AWS API for these five secrets. And then we're going to drop all of this into a response object and just return that back to the console. So we'll hit test. What we'll see here is our function ran successfully. So my secret came from an S3 bucket that no one had access to. But now you know that the secret was, hello, Alaska Developers Alliance, with a new line. Uh, the secret environment 
Uh, okay, this is something I forgot to mention uh, before I ran this. So secret environment, this is storing an environment variable in a Lambda function, which is down here. And the reason I don't recommend doing this is because this value is visible to everyone who has access to view this Lambda function. So you don't get the benefit of encryption or obfuscation from people that don't have access to it. But that's an easy access with this process.env. So it's just an environment variable, right? Then SSM parameter store. So this is the plain SSM that we saw, the plain secret. You'll notice there are two exclamation points now. The encrypted value, I called it once without decryption and once uh, with decryption. This is what you get back if you don't have the right to decrypt the value, right? And so it is a very long string that is entirely worthless. So this is a way you can protect your encrypted secrets from developers that don't have access to decrypt the secret because they, you know, if they have access to request it but don't have access to decrypt it, they just get this value that's entirely worthless. If they can decrypt it, they get this decrypted value. And this is the SSM, uh, sorry, this is uh, Secrets Manager, where I stored a key value pair of my database password and uh, database password value. And that's you know, very useful. You can store multiple key value pairs together. And you can just basically inject this entire secret into your SQL connection um, as you know, an object to be parsed. So what I'll show you here with this plain secret, right? Is I'll go ahead and edit this. And I'll say, this was changed. Hit save changes. Now we're going to go back over here and run a test again. You can see just like that, using SSM, I've just changed the value of the secret that was injected into my uh, function. So it's that fast, right? If you need to instantly you know, change configuration values or uh, change anything that you're, uh, you're running in your application, database passwords, anything like that, it's that fast to change. All right, so that was the live code demonstration. I am happy to uh, open source that code somewhere if anyone, anyone would like it for future reference. Um, and certainly happy to walk through implementation of how to do all of that with anyone who would like it. At a high level, this is how I've done this stuff in my career. And I like to say this is an example of imperfect security. I think it's pretty perfect, but like I said, anyone who does cybersecurity uh, will tell you that there are a million ways to skin a cat, and there's probably some issues with the way I'm doing this in terms of trade-offs. If any of you do see outright vulnerabilities in what I'm going to walk through in terms of logic, please let me know. It'd be great to change what I'm doing. All right, so open source software. Um, this is actually a library that I wrote and have released. Uh, I just got it into CI/CD today. I use Circle CI for my continual uh, integration and deployment pipeline. Within my CI, uh, my Circle CI context, I have environment variables that pass my AWS credentials to a Suma role. I have a GitHub Hub token. Uh, GitHub Hub is the CLI tool that GitHub released that allows you to do like GitHub releases and stuff like that. So that is tokenized. I have my GitHub username and email inside my environment variables. Notice I don't have a password because I use a GitHub OAuth token to actually authenticate with GitHub. And I have a signing PGP key that I stored in S3. And I use this to basically cryptographically sign the changes to my application prior to uploading it to the Launchpad PPA. The next thing is provisioning production services. So this is a bit of my CI CD pipeline for deploying out uh, Kubernetes pods. So again, we use CI CD through Circle CI. We have a context that carries with it AWS credentials to allow you to assume a role. We then use a wrapper uh, somebody wrote called SSM-ENV, which basically wraps a Docker entry point with a decryption command. So we store our environment variables in a cube template prefixed with an SSM string. Uh, so that environment variable basically references the SSM secret name. It doesn't actually reference the value. We then, um, on the entry point command within Docker, when Kubernetes runs the pod, the entry point is basically a script to call SSM, which then checks the permissions that the pod is running with to make sure it can actually decrypt 
these credentials. And then when it can decrypt the credentials, uh, sends back the plain text credentials into an environment variable inside of the pod. So the reason this is good is if you don't have access to the pod, like if you're hosting on like Fargate or something like that, this is actually a fairly secure way of loading in credentials. But if you can get access to the console inside of one of your pods, then you can just you know, basically type env and you get a list of all the environment variables to the screen, which will include the plain text value of all of these SSM um, parameters. On the suggestion of, I think it was Arsh brought this up. If you have like super duper secrets and you're like, I don't trust managed services, uh, HashiCorp Vault is great. It allows you to do an N of M uh, unlocking mechanism. So you can basically distribute uh, parts of your private key and you need X number of them to uh, unlock your vault. Uh, that's incredibly helpful for like super sensitive data. I've, I've stored very, very sensitive data uh, inside of a HashiCorp Vault before. Um, I actually have moved on to AWS Managed Services for that same data now, but that's useful. Ansible encrypted configurations as well. If you're familiar with storing Ansible configurations in an encrypted format, you can check this into GitHub as long as you have a way to distribute the unlock key, which you don't want to check into GitHub. And then if you don't trust any one person with your secret, you can look at doing Shamir's secret sharing. <clears throat> and for those of you that aren't super versed in cryptography, basically Shamir's share is a, um, it's a way to do math on higher order polynomials where you can basically reverse the highest order of the polynomial and find a similar curve that intersects the y-axis at the same value as the original high order polynomial that was used in the algorithm. And that intercept uh, allows you to then derive the private key. And for any of you who actually know the math behind this, please correct me if I totally screwed that up. I'm going off of what I learned on Wikipedia uh, earlier today. The next thing then is uh, private keys and wallets. So AWS KMS is great for private keys that rotate for encryption and decryption and signing. Uh, Cloud HSM is great if you need FIPS 140-2 compliance. And again, that basically just is a federal standard that has to deal with um, the entropy of the key that you're generating for that private key. And Cloud HSM, because there is the separate private key hardware module um, that follows with FIPS 140-2. If you're in cryptocurrency, uh, I actually store some of my private keys for some of my wallets in EC2 SSM parameter store in a secure encrypted string that I then decrypt and load into functions on runtime. Um, I'm experimenting with using Secrets Manager so I can call them via API as well. One thing to note though, if you do want to use AWS for your private uh, key wallet storage, is that what's called Kekik signing, which is the um, signing algorithm used by Ethereum, is not supported via AWS KMS. They're working on it, supposedly, is what I heard from the product manager of uh, AWS's uh, blockchain group. If you're thinking all this sounds great, but wow, that's really, really complex and there's no way I'm ever going to implement this, I'm just gonna stick with plain text in a file checked into a repo. The good news is there's a ton of repositories available. Oh, sorry, libraries available. So you just saw the couple lines of code that I use in AWS to manipulate all these secrets. That literally took me about 20 minutes earlier today, 20, 30 minutes earlier today to write all of that code and store all those secrets. So it's not difficult with a ton of libraries that are available. If you don't want to use AWS, uh, Kubernetes has libraries available, bash slash ZSH. There's a ton of command line options for encrypting, decrypting, loading in PGP keys. Docker will also do this. And if you like the serverless stack, serverless.com has a pro package that they will manage encryption of uh, private values for you. Nothing talking about secrets would be complete unless we mentioned the fact that secrets do you no good when they're stored in private, or sorry, when they're stored in an encrypted form and you've lost the private key. So make sure you back up your critical secrets in multiple places and test your backups. Um, for me, critical secrets like private keys that I use for encrypting a lot of data. Uh, like for instance, my wedding photos are encrypted and globally distributed. Um, I have the decryption key in multiple places in multiple formats, including printed out in the safety deposit box. So you might want to think about doing this if you have stuff that you absolutely cannot lose. Um, certainly if you are working with secrets 
like you know the master private key on your keychain for a corporation, then we can get even more complex with our secret storage scheme. Um, one of the things that I was actually very impressed by, and this is my second to last slide here, um, but I was impressed by a company I had called that was doing custodial cold, cold storage of cryptocurrency for hedge funds. So they accept deposits globally and they are under just about every financial regulator in the world in terms of the rules that apply to them. So what they do is they have a multi-signature wallet so it requires multiple wallets to sign a transaction to even make it go across the blockchain. Those multiple wallets are geographically distributed around the globe. Most of them are physical hardware wallets, but some of them are actually logically generated Shamir secret share private keys that are printed out. And then they back up the hardware wallets, uh, the recovery phrase to paper. They physically rip those sheets of paper apart, color code them, um, and then geographically distribute the hardware, the backup secrets and the, uh, the sheets of paper around uh, global banking partners in safety deposit boxes that are both geographically, regulatorily, and uh, business-wise different banks distributed. And it's distributed in such a way that getting N of M wallets for signing a transaction doesn't allow retrieval of the remaining wallet credentials to begin to piece together private keys. And even if someone were able to get access to a private key by piecing together the various components, they have a key ring based swapping of approval wallets by supermajority consensus so they can kick that private key out of being one of the wallets that is allowed to sign. And if you're thinking, wow, that sounds like what I need for my $10 in ETH, like probably not, um, but you can get really crazy with some of these secret share or uh, secret storage in terms of how easy you need to use it in an application versus how secure it needs to be. That is all I have prepared. Any Thank questions? you, Adam. That was that was amazing. And uh, apologies for not really getting your intro uh, <laughs> so detailed. You did uh, fantastic with that. And I just got to give you mad props for pulling an incredible presentation out with one day notice. So cheers to Adam for that. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Adam. Um, I've got a couple of questions for you. So when you are deciding, you know, where to store keys. So right now, uh, I've been building a CI/CD pipeline with uh, Chris Bailey, and we're sort of torn on like where we're storing keys for things, right? Like we've got keys in, in GitHub for CI/CD, um, but ultimately we're still just spinning up an environment. So um, potentially we could store a bunch of those. Like we could just store like your master access key to the, the uh, AWS key management service in there and then just use that to access those secrets? What do, what do you do in those strategies or in those situations? Yeah, so what I have for CI CD um, is, and I, I have to backtrack a little bit on a previous um, statement I made of never use the access keys programmatically. You have to use the access keys programmatically in Circle CI. Um, because it is not a part of the AWS system. But so what I have is basically those access keys are scoped in permission such that you can only assume limited roles into my deployment environments. Um, and so basically all that, all that user is allowed to do is like log into my development environment and push code into an S3 bucket, which then you know, kicks off um, my, my CDN refreshing uh, with the new content. And so like, so like that's a single page react app deploy, or like, it'll like log into the Kubernetes cluster and just run a, um, cube apply on, you know, given a, a predefined template it gets from a repository. So that deployer doesn't actually have access to those secrets. What happens then is once it does like a cube apply, then the pod has a role that allows it to decrypt the SSM parameters that are stored in environment variables. And so the pod itself actually then goes out separate from the CI/CD process as the pod is starting and grabs the, uh, the variables from SSM parameters store, sort of decrypts them, loads them into the environment variables. Um, likewise, we actually did this with a Lambda where our CI/CD pipeline, all it does is update the Lambda code, but then the role that the Lambda runs under 
has the ability to go ask Secrets Manager for database connection credentials. And then that way it has access to the database. So we, we built like a huge firewall between our CI not even having access to the secrets and our programs having access to the secrets. Okay, that yeah, that makes sense. So are, are you using like HashiCorp Vault in any for anything at this point? Uh, I am not. All of our secret storage that we do is handled via SSM Parameter Store, Secrets Manager, or like for the secrets that don't really matter. Um, like we have like an internal queue, like user agent header that needs to be set. Um, it's just like a random little string. Like we just store that in Kubernetes secrets. Um, Cause it's one of those things like, eh, if you get that, like, yeah, maybe you can put some stuff onto the queue, but all of our workers are intelligent enough that we'll just ignore it. <laughs> so, so do you, so like uh, uh, you're on GitHub then, right? For, for your, yep. your CI CD, are you guys using like GitHub actions? I am not yet. Uh, we use Circle CI, which is a separate service. Okay. Um, yeah, we started that process before GitHub came out with GitHub Actions. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that so that makes sense. So essentially, you've got a really limited role. You give that access key as a, a secret to the whatever your job runner is, and then that gets all the secrets you need to do the build. And then the actual deploy grabs separate secrets and and has what it needs to get those. Is that is that right? Yeah. So, so the, the one phrase you use there, you know, your deploy runner gets all the secrets it needs. Um, basically what that looks like for us, and, and I'm happy to go into like the fine points of AWS IAM because it's a really confusing concept and I really love it. Um, but essentially what our role, what, what our user credentials do is it, it gets temporary credentials that are good for like 30 minutes to deploy code. And that's the only secret it has access to. And after 30 minutes, right, those credentials go away. And so even if you were somehow to get your hands on our logs or write a CI script that cats environment variables to console, you only have like 30 minutes, right? Interesting, cool, thanks. Any other questions out there? Yeah, um, there's a question from the YouTube chat um, that says, I've used uh, ENV files stored on S3 and pulled at runtime with roles set up so only the function or instance can read the file and a couple specific users can read or write. Any thoughts? Yeah, um, so I, I like that setup provided the S3 bucket that you have is very locked down. Uh, and what I mean by that is there is now a setting on S3 buckets you can check that basically says block all public access. Uh, you want to make sure that's checked. That's a programmatic enforcement so that if anyone even tries to uh, set a bucket policy that is overly permissive and allows public access, it will overwrite and revert that. So you want to make sure that's checked. You want to make sure your credentials that you are storing have some sort of SSE dash something encryption. So the easiest way to do that is you basically go into your bucket, go to properties, click on uh, encryption or default encryption, I think it is. And you just click uh, SSE KMS. And what that means is AWS automatically provisions a key that is unique to your account and region to encrypt um, your S3 content. And you click that and then re-upload the file. Um, I, I shouldn't even know if you need to re-upload the file, but it'll basically just encrypt on disk. And the idea there is you want to make sure that you know AWS staff doesn't have access to see it because you're storing it in plain text, right? Um, and so with those two then, and then if you turn on versioning as a third thing, that will give you an audit trail into making sure in case something does change, you know who changed it and why. Um, so that's kind of what I'd say. But, but that being said, what I would encourage you to do, um, and this like now we're going to get into like speed optimizations, is on the uh, VPC routing layer, if you add S3 as a... Um, uh, network endpoint, and terminology is escaping me now, but essentially you can route all calls to S3 on your uh, VPN internally through AWS's network, so you never go external. Uh, that adds another uh, layer of privacy to your environment variables being loaded in. It also speeds up that call substantially. So if you're using like Lambda, you're going to get the benefit of never leaving AWS's internal dark fiber.
I have a question for you, Adam, uh, about the earlier part of your presentation. When you were giving an overview of these other kinds of secrets, uh, such as Wi-Fi passwords, door codes, um, have there been any stabs at, at managing these sorts of things ephemerally and, and effectively uh, for, for a workforce? Like you, I'm a one password user, but um, I am just still encrypting dot pass, dot one password files on my NAS and syncing it. So I, I feel I'm a little old school in kind of managing those secrets, but are there best practices today that you can talk about a bit? Yeah, so I use the one password paid version. Uh, so I don't have access to the local file. I sync everything up to the cloud. Um, I, you know, people vary depending on on how much they care about that or not. I know some people that are die hard that they would never do that. Uh, I know some people that are totally fine with it. If you don't, if you don't like the idea of a cloud service provider having your file, but you also don't like the idea of having to be responsible for a single point of failure, like remembering to back up your you know, one password file to an S. There's a company called MyKey, it's M-Y-K-I, and they basically do a distributed peer-to-peer -peer amongst your device's backup system. So if you sync like your phone and your laptop and your desktop, it will basically share your password file and update between all three. Um, I've had some, some good success with it when I, when I used them about a year ago. Um, beyond that, what I'd say for Wi-Fi passwords, and this is again, depending on how much you want to spend, but what we do is we use a company called Mosile, M-O-S-Y-L-E. They are a MDM uh, provider, so a mobile device management provider. They work with Mac OS. And one of the settings they have that I can basically provision is I can provision a wireless uh, password network. Sorry, a, a wireless SSID network. So I uh, give the SSID and I give the password. And I basically push that down to all my employees' laptops. So everyone's laptop automatically becomes provisioned with the correct network password which is really cool. It also makes changing it fairly simple as well, right? Because you, you push down a new network password and swap a network password. Right, um, that, uh, that makes total sense. The other one that I was wondering about is essentially just that, you know, when you are managing uh, data on a NAS, uh, you know, the last XR project that I worked on um, during the peak, uh, we were hitting 50 gigabytes a day in point cloud uh, data that was getting generated. Um, so that was all going on to the NAS since I had a couple of different systems that were accessing and processing that. But it gets challenging in terms of dealing with backups and redundancy. Um, and I wonder if you know there are best practices for securing large amounts of data, not necessarily to put into the cloud, um, but to send over the network to, um, to another NAS that you don't necessarily trust. Gotcha. Um... What I'd say is we should probably take that offline just to kind of chat about yeah, this. There's absolutely. a couple questions I have in terms of like how you're transferring it and the drive speeds and stuff like that. Um, like for instance, like sending that amount of data to like an NVMe drive shouldn't cause that much of an issue um, like at all. Because <laughs> you're, you're writing at like a gig a second on an NVMe. Great. Great. We'll, we'll chat some more. Thanks. Yeah, for sure. Other questions out there? Uh, I just want to comment that I'm one of those people who would love to see more on uh, I am and uh, some of the, the nuts and bolts and the weed stuff. So if you are interested in doing any kind of follow up, uh, I'm super interested. Awesome. Yeah, I, I will talk at endless length about AWS. Uh, kind of a fan. So <laughs> let me know if you guys are sick of hearing about it. But otherwise, if you want to know more, I am happy to dive fairly deep into just about any system AWS has. Yeah. Um, and actually, maybe on that note, uh, what do you guys think about announcing our, our boot camp theme for the year? For it. All right. So, um, as, as some of you guys know, uh, we, we separated off. Uh, the, the board into um, another group. So we've got five people who are sort of on the steering committee who are helping make the bigger picture decisions. And so we got together uh, a few weeks ago and we all um, looked at the results of the developer survey and um, DevOps was one of the things that people were super interested in. 
it's also really highly sought after. So um, in looking at, at what we thought would be a good fit, not only for the, the community, but also for um, individual skill sets and employability, um, DevOps seemed to be a good fit. So as of now, um, we're looking at AWS. Um, it could change, but it will be some cloud provider, um, probably not GCP. So either Azure or AWS. Um, we need to talk to some more companies around town, but obviously things are a little crazy right now. Um, but yeah, we, we're looking into offering a, a full training um, that would be, you know, hands-on. We're running labs, uh, depending on, on, you know, how we're able to frame the course. Uh, I would love to have it set up so that, you know, by the end of the, the three days or whatever, um, you know, you're ready to take a, an AWS test and, and get a certification. But We'll, we'll get honed in um, as we get closer to that time and, and as we uh, see what the landscape for any sort of travel or group activities looks like. <laughs> um, and if anybody has any comments on that, I, I'd love to hear. Um, but as of now, uh, I'm pretty excited about, about doing DevOps stuff. It's pretty fun. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that announcement, Jeff. We have any more questions for Adam? I want to make sure uh, everybody's gotten a chance to get a word in if they want. Okay. Well, on the meetup side, I will just add to folks, uh, we'll probably be doing something similar to this next month. Our planned speaker for tonight, uh, Claire Cortell, is dealing with uh, situations unfolding down in the Bay Area. So hopefully she will be joining us next month by Zoom to talk to us about uh, mapping. Uh, she is, um, I believe, head of mapping for Lyft. Uh, so exciting talk coming up in that format. And if you have any thoughts on uh, the Zoom format or another way you'd like to see things go uh, for these meetups as we're doing remotely, definitely be active on Slack and uh, letting us know your thoughts. Anybody else have uh, something to add tonight? Uh, if anybody is like lonely working from home and, and just wants to do like a, a 15 minute coffee uh, water cooler chat throughout the day, um, I, I did see like a funny Slack plugin um, from the guys at Test Double and it takes two random people from Slack and pairs them for, for a chat once a week. Uh, I would totally be down to add that to the Developers Alliance Slack if there's some interest for it. It'd be pretty fun. Nice. All right, don't all jump in at once, but I <laughs> all of you. That is, that is a good idea. Uh, I see two people uh, drinking now, so if we had beer, this would be where we all sort yeah, of go over to the kitchen. Like <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was, I was going to say there's been uh, some whiskey meetups going on. Um, uh, there's a new uh, Chrome plugin for uh, Netflix where you can do party uh, watching of a movie. You know, get our social distancing stuff out. <laughs> hey, we even got uh, Brian, Brian Walsh here. I got to do a shout out for him. I haven't seen you in a while, man. Yeah. Well, thanks. Glad to be here. Glad you guys are doing this. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Also, uh, I'm going to give a shout out to Dane because I don't know what you got going on in that room of yours, but it looks awesome and you've got LED lights. <laughs> yeah, I can't. looks like the Fast and the Furious back there. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, it's it's a workbench. It's uh, that's that's where the uh, when when and getting cleaned up here because of the uh, extra time at home here. Uh, but we'll see how how it goes here. We might have some uh, interesting projects to show off in the future. Yeah, that would be great. Uh, perhaps we can get another event going, DevOps Cribs or something like that, where uh, you show people where you write your code or build your stuff. <laughs> Yeah, you should see this side of the, the other side of the room where I'm where, when I'm looking at it, it looks uh, it's getting more and more to look like uh, that uh, image from the Matrix with 
uh, one, two, three, four, five, five monitors in front of me with uh, three more to be going up on the wall here shortly. There you go. Wow. <laughs> hey, also, uh, uh, Dane wanted uh, a, a boat, or he had a boat for Terraform plus AWS. Um, that's something uh, we're actually working on at, at my company, Legalverse. So um, yeah, we'll, we'll definitely uh, circle back on that. Um, I, I'd love to, to hear more. So either we can find somebody who's like an expert in it and crushing it, uh, or I'd be happy to uh, present, um, you know, at, at some point in the future. Actually, I, I just, when you mentioned that, I, I, I know somebody who is a wizard at this stuff who uh, now works for Chef, uh, um, Will Fisher, who used to be uh, one of our Alaska developers, but is now down in the uh, Seattle area dealing with uh, that issue cool well um so bradley is taking care of the the meetup programming maybe you could send an intro email and, and we could see if uh, that would be a fit it would be great uh, yeah awesome thanks do you guys have any advice for somebody who's in the very beginning of their computer science career getting into developer operations devops because Right now, I'm just starting to collaborate on projects with other people, and it's not just my code. So I wonder if anyone here has any advice on that. Uh, I, I've got one piece to start. So learn learn the basic Git flow, and and just like at, at at the absolute like minimum that will put you like five steps ahead is just never commit to the master branch. <laughs> like use GitHub Actions or find a way to do uh, automated merges or, or even just do standard pull requests. But the sooner you get used to committing on separate branches and doing merge requests uh, or pull requests into the master branch, the, the better. And then the, the next thing that was really big for me was to really compartmentalize the things that you're learning. So I've started out, you know, I wanted to deploy a Lambda function using Terraform. Well, I started using Terraform. Then I realized the gap in my knowledge was actually AWS or Lambda, and then I have to go back. And so what I do is I sort of build the simplest thing, um, whether you know that's like get my code working to upload to uh, Lambda, and then I make sure that it's working in Lambda, and then the next thing is I might actually use a tool like Terraform to, to build and push it out to Lambda. But if you try to do that starting at the beginning, like it, it can be hard to know whether your your gap in knowledge or the problem you're having is related to um, either your code or the um, environment like AWS that it's running in or the tool that's deploying the environment. So if you start and work on each one of those and then automate backwards, that seems to be the best way that I've found. Um, I would say one other thing to add just kind of fundamentally is make sure you learn about how networks work and what and, and VLANs, VPCs, all those sorts of things that I've met a lot of, especially people that come from the more development side really have no concept about how the physical infrastructure they're working on works. And DevOps kind of bridges between those two. So you really kind of have to have at least an understanding of both sides. Hey guys, this is Vince. I'm sorry, I'm being late. Um, I'm running to the hospital now. I'm doing a lot of stuff for this COVID thing right now. They have me developing all these web apps. So I got to go do that real quick, but I'll, I'll be able to catch up. <laughs> so a great resource that I was introduced to um, at my previous work, um, hint for Dane, we should pay for it, is Linux Academy. Um, if you're a student, you get you get the first three months for $80. And it's a great resource. Um, and they're super focused on DevOps. So if you want to start like a actually like you know going through courses, um, structured learning, I would highly suggest Linux Academy, and they have an integration with AWS, so like they give you cloud servers and stuff for free to practice along. Can Can you post a link to that um, in the Dev Alliance uh, um, chat, general or whatever? Yeah, I can do that after the meeting's up. Yeah. Um. Also, somebody uh, in the chat mentioned enforcing code style via linter. That was a, a really big one that uh, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of. Um, this is really funny in, in Ruby land. There's no types or type checking, but uh, linters can really help you a lot with maintaining you know, everything from proper indentation across multiple users with different IDEs to catching bugs um, or, or just like bad 
bad coding practice. Um, so I don't know what language you're, you're in, but yeah, using using a linter is awesome. I use uh, the the standard RB from Test Double, and then Go has uh, Go Funct, which is sort of a built-in tool that was released with the language uh, G O F M T. All right, thank you. I'll say kind of one last piece of advice from my career is so it's kind of landed in DevOps by way of infrastructure and backend coding. Um, do everything by hand using a GUI or GUI or the console first, and then do everything via the CLI, and then try to automate it. Automation is really the running. If you've only ever done fully automated systems, it's like knowing how to sprint, but having no idea why or how or how to walk. If you do it by hand and then you do it by the CLI, you'll understand what you're doing and that will make you a much better person to do DevOps if that's what you want to get into. But mirroring what Dave said, know your network's down pat, right? Like if you can't immediately come up with the OSI model off the top of your head, like you're not gonna make the right choices for infrastructure. <laughs> Just one more if I can add on there. I'm new. So my name is Bryce. Um, all really good answers. Um, one thing that um, I found mattered a lot to me was early on in my career, I'd build hobby examples to learn these technologies. I'd say, oh, I want to learn learn this new cool thing. I'm going to build an example demo. But what made a huge difference is building something real. And so I think uh, start with you know these example projects and simple Simple things, but what's helped me learn all this stuff for real was trying to build a piece of software, a service to ship to users and have users depend on it and sweat a little bit when maybe things aren't working correctly. Maybe my pipeline's not as durable as it ought to be, or I'm doing something or I'm you know, not doing something. And so, you know, over time, try to imagine as you're learning these things, what kind of thing maybe you could actually really build that would somebody else would find usable. And then use some of these things you're learning to build that system and have some actual skin in it. And then you'll, you'll find that you'll learn things that don't come out of those like AWS how to blog posts. Is there a good step after making, let's just say private GitHub repos or dot git uh, ignore files? Is there maybe one step after that that I could start using when I'm working with APIs? Because right now I feel like there's no real use for me to if I'm when I'm writing code to make it into a public GitHub repo, if I'm gonna somehow store something in plain text or somehow just mess something up like that, is there a good step right after that that you guys have had an experience? Do you have something deployed to a server that's not your laptop? No, not yet. That would probably be a good next step. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, um, look into AWS. Um, if you're a new customer, the first year basically um, you can run a t2.micro Linux instance for free for an entire year. So yeah, the free tier is pretty helpful um, to start getting playing with AWS. And I would just add, you know, and align with what you say, having a purpose to do something, set yourself little challenges. You can over engineer something. Uh, you know, the simplest way to get up a website is to go on to Square or Wix, but you can also create, you know, a website that uses a complex CI CD pipeline that you build for yourself um, just to deploy your website. Um, so give yourself, you know, little sample projects that at the end of it have something valuable for you and you can kind of teach yourself the tools that you're going to need along the way. Yeah, jumping off of that, like a good, a really good example is like, make a portfolio website, right? And then if you use something like Angular or something, you can hook that into a CI CD pretty easily. I would also add, don't don't feel, don't be afraid to reach out to the people here and, and, and the other people you know to ask questions about how to, how things work because there's a lot of experience of people that have made made this made the mistakes that you're likely to make the first time. So don't 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 ever think that you know, it's not okay to ask a question because they, everyone here is always willing to help. Also, it, it looks like there is a DevOps channel. If we want, we can, um, I mean, it's, it's just not being used. There's like 20 people in it, but we can totally resurrect that and direct uh, 
direct chat to there and, and make an announcement about that in general so people uh, people could get into it. All right, it's about 8.17. Um, I wanna be respectful of people's spaces since we're all working from home as well. Um, I think we're at the end of the scheduled time, so if people need to drop off, that's okay. Um, but I'll also uh, keep everything up for a while if folks want to chat. Bradley, I'm gonna I'm gonna drop off, but I'll make a. I've got a, a wife who is a public health professional, and so I'll make a public service announcement in terms of, uh, you know, I think our uh, we're all more familiar with technology, and there's a lot of people out there that are not familiar with technology and so they're not using it to its full extent in terms of connecting in a time when a lot of us are i mean we're stay at home a lot of other people are stay at home and i think that's the wise thing to do right now so i just uh you know take take a little inventory of people you know and uh take an opportunity to reach out to them whether it's facetime or zoom get them set up on zoom some way these sort of meetups you know they're no big deal for us and they're really valuable, but a lot of other people, this is a really unfamiliar technology or intimidating it the first time they do it. And uh, I think us as technical professionals have an opportunity to kind of help people. So anyway, just take an inventory of people you know and try to find a way to connect with them. I think uh, we're probably in this for longer than we think. So the more people get used to it and uh, learn to connect this way, I think the better off we'll all be. So there's your public service announcement for tonight. <laughs> Thanks, Sounds like Brian. a good way to close. Thank you, Brian. Yeah. What, one last note. Um, I went ahead. I had a couple people message me privately that were stoked on the coffee uh, idea. So I am making a channel called uh, Coffee Shop. And if you're interested in randomly linking up with somebody once a week, just go ahead and join that channel. And then the coffee bot will uh, link you up and schedule a time. Sweet. Cool. All right. See you guys. Thanks for presenting, Adam. Yeah, thank you, Adam. That was yeah, great. Thank you, Adam. So thanks, Adam. Thanks, Adam. All right, thanks, Adam. Thank you. All right. Later, guys. Later.